Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our cybersecurity lecture series. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce today's distinguished speaker, uh, Professor uh, Christopher Krugel. Christopher is a full professor of computer science at UC Santa Barbara. He was also a co-founder of Lastline, a company that provides AI-powered network security solution and recently acquired by uh, VMware. Christopher's research interests focus on computer and communication security uh, with an emphasis on malware analysis and detection, web security, and intrusion detection. Uh, he has published more than 100 peer-reviewed papers in the top cybersecurity conferences. Uh, um, he was also a recipient of the ASF Career Award, MIT um, Technology Review TR35 Award for Young Innovators, uh, IBM Faculty Award, and several best paper awards. He regularly serves on the program committees of leading um, computer security conferences and speaks at industry venues such as Black Hat and ISAC. Today, Christopher is going to talk about how to find vulnerabilities in embedded software. Chris, the floor is yours. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction and uh, thanks a lot for having me in your uh, lecture series. Um, we've chatted a little bit about this before. Um, if you have any questions during the talk, you know, feel free to uh, use the chat or, or the Q&A um, window and um, you know you can also try to raise your hand and um, we'll, we'll happy to uh, unmute you so you know any any kind of interaction we'll try to support. Um, so I'm in system security and um, as um, it's been pointed out uh, you know I've had a variety of interests that span malware and, and web security and intrusion detection uh, but uh, you know one one other passion is uh, finding vulnerabilities and uh, I think I've, I've, I've worked for, for a long time on, on both static and dynamic analysis techniques to find vulnerabilities in systems. And um, one of the areas where we try to look for vulnerabilities in the last few years has been uh, embedded software, firmware that runs on IoT devices or uh, industrial control systems. And that's really what I wanna talk today about. I wanna talk a little bit about firmware and the security problems in this area, and then uh, dive into the meat of the presentation pointing uh, to, um, you know, two, three recent papers that we did, both on static analysis um, of Linux firmware and particularly looking at multi-binary vulnerability analysis in the area of uh, Linux firmware, as well as the problem of dealing with binary blobs. So these are firmware programs where there is no clear operating system and basically all the libraries and the application code and maybe parts of the operating system or real-time operating system are all packed together in one big binary blob, making it much harder to analyze. And here we are particularly looking at the question of how you can use dynamic analysis or fast testing um, to, to analyze this firmware and the problem of rehosting it. And uh, if we have some time, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, maybe a more philosophical problem of automation in security, uh, vulnerability testing, and a system we have developed that uses Santa Barbara and now at ASU uh, from some of our students that is called Anger, that uh, is really something that we have used a lot for binary analysis in, in various domains. And um, I just want to make sure that you know people are aware of it if they're interested in that field and uh, you know might might want to use it or find it useful. All right, so I, I think uh, you know I'll, I'll go over the introduction very quickly. I think we all know the Internet of Things. IoT devices are, are you know become very ubiquitous. There are a very wide variety of different devices. And you know in in a recent paper, um, you know the folks that studied this uh, found that. Uh, you know, a, a large fraction of, of homes in North America have some kind of IoT devices, and you can see here, right, this could be smart light bulbs, but it could also be uh, some, some cameras or, or locks or thermostats, and, you know, some are just used to automate things at your home, and, you know, you turn on the light or turn off the light, and maybe that is less, uh, you know, security sensitive, but when you talk about cameras or smart locks um, or things that can record um, what's going on in your home, then, it's clear that there are more security sensitive issues there. And uh, that's why I think it's important to, to look at the security of these devices, to try to find vulnerabilities and really, um, you know, hopefully patch them, remediate them and, and secure them. And so, you know, one, one question that you might ask, what's different about IoT devices, right? Why, why are we particularly looking or in, uh, why do we consider vulnerability analysis of IoT devices to be something different than normal programs, right? Uh, you could say, well, we've done vulnerability analysis on Windows and Linux programs for a very long time. So now you have a software that maybe comes in a different form factor. Um, 
what's different? Why, why would I care? Why do I need new, new techniques? And I just wanted to sort of point out some of the challenges here. I mean, there's this one um, sort of saying quantity has a quality all its own. It's attributed to various people. Um, but I think the, the key idea here is when you scale up and you have so many of something, you have so many devices and you have all these heterogeneity, it's, it, things are very diverse, things are very different. Uh, then there are some emerging properties that might need to be taken into account or, or some things that you could do maybe by, by manually fixing a problem in the case of analyzing a Linux problem um, just doesn't scale anymore. You just can't do it for IoT devices. And you would have to find automated ways to handle problems that you might still manually address when you do vulnerability analysis, let's say for, for a regular Linux program. I've already talked a little bit about binary blobs where you don't have your typical OS or library abstractions. You have software that is very, very deeply connected with hardware. And there's an extreme diversity of these hardware and peripheral components. We will see this when we talk about rehosting. It's a, it's a central problem of, of how you can even run a firmware program in an analysis environment when you want to do fast testing. While it's very easy for a Linux program, obviously it's often very, very hard for a firmware program. Uh, it's even hard to get access to that firmware program. You know, it's uh, in there, it's embedded in this device. Uh, you know, sometimes you get a debug port uh, and then you can sort of read it out. Sometimes you can scrape some binaries from a website, but in, in general, it's very hard to get access. Uh, you have complex interactions in, in these IoT ecosystems, right? So this is, um, for example, here, just to turn on the light, right? You see Alexa, turn on the light. And there are many, many components that might be involved, like you know, some, some component in the cloud, like if this, then that, the website that then talks to a hub that then you know, might be from another vendor, then the, the bulb that talks to a vendor-specific hub that then talks to that actual light bulb, right? So as you can see, there are many steps involved that involve, you know, devices, the cloud, different protocols. So obviously in that complex interaction, uh, it's not Turing, it should be turning, sorry, turning on the light. Um, there are all these seams and cracks where issues can happen, right? And so there's this, this complexity. And if you find a bug, then there's even the question of how do you, how do you patch it, right? A lot of the vendors, um, you know, build cheap devices that are not necessarily um, equipped with anything to upgrade them, right? Uh, some, some vendors might put out devices, they're long gone. So if you find these bugs, what do you do? Can't even fix them, right? And, and then you have the question of remote accessibility in certain areas. Um, for example, if you have a device um, like a pacemaker, um, you know, it's also an embedded device and there's an emergency and someone needs access quickly to do something with it, for example, to uh, revive you uh, or to make your heart beat again. But then there's some access control that says, well, you cannot just randomly access my heart, uh, my pacemaker, right? I don't want that. So, so how do you solve this problem of access control in certain you know, real world scenarios where you have embedded devices that interact with the real world often in very uh, tight fashions. So a lot of security problems, um, a lot of devices, um, as you can imagine, there's then the obligatory scare slide on all security presentations. Um, here are some you know, random collection of some, some newspaper articles where it just show, shows that the situation is, is sort of dire, right? I mean, there uh, a lot of these bugs are found everywhere. Uh, people are more and more reliant. And so things are generally, you know, terrible. Uh, there's the Mirai botnet, uh, you know, that was one of the more famous instances where a lot of embedded devices have been, IoT devices have been compromised and then abused uh, for a botnet and created a very, very large denial of service attacks. So clearly there is a problem um, and we want to, to work on it. And so this is um, where we want to do some vulnerability analysis. And, and obviously you know, it's very unlikely that you get source code. So you have to do binary vulnerability analysis. And um, um, that's what you know we're we're talking about in, in this presentation. And you know, just to make sure, right? You know, you, you get those 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 binary programs, and you try to find uh, typically exploitable uh, flaws in the software that might allow an attacker to gain access to the device or make the device do things it's not supposed to do. So that's you know finding a vulnerability. And we start we start simple uh, in a sense, or we start an easier problem. We first look at Linux firmware, right? Um, I already mentioned this. A lot of firmware um, that is uh, binary blobs, where you know you have everything packed into one binary. But in many cases, it's also built around Linux or some some you know stripped down versions of Windows. Um, and you know that there was this study done. It's already a little older um, that I could find here. But a lot of the the firmware is still essentially just Linux programs, right? So you have your 
device specific code. These are Linux programs, Linux binaries that run on the Linux operating system. They can use system calls. And then Linux itself uh, interacts with the hardware peripherals, for example, through MMIO or, or other ways like input output. And the, the nice thing is that we have the operating system abstraction here. So if we get a firmware image, it's essentially a Linux image where you will have a lot of binaries and those binaries operate like you would expect and they will make their system calls and you can perform the analysis um, somewhat similar to what you would do when you have a normal Linux program, which is great. That means you can do, you know, things like static analysis. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting challenges that we found with those Linux based firmware is that in many cases, you know, you don't just have one binary. Um, you have like in a normal system, many binaries, multiple components. And but what we see is that if you have a particular functionality, um, let's say, you know, you want to interact with your IoT device through let's say an app on your phone or something else, um, there's not one binary that is um, involved in, in, in um, there is not, not, um, not one binary involved in, in handling the request. Uh, you might have a web server and you, you, you do the request and then the web server handles it, uh, hands it off to maybe a CGI bin, uh, some handler binary that actually does the work and then you get the response back. Uh, I just got a question, are the binaries obfuscated by the manufacturers? Um, the binaries themselves are typically not obfuscated. Uh, what we see is that the, the, the firmware image itself might be obfuscated. So it might be packed or it might be encrypted um, you know, in a particular way so that we can actually not even unpack it. Uh, but once you have the, the Linux image, then the binaries themselves are typically, um, you know, they're of course stripped and everything, but we haven't seen much obfuscation and hardening at the level of the binaries themselves. So um, what is interesting here is now when you look for vulnerabilities, you would need to look at the whole system, right? If you have a vulnerability, let's say in the handler, um, well, then you would want to know that uh, there is actually user input that could come from the web server that is handed to that handler that might um, exploit that vulnerability. And if you just would focus on these, these border binaries like the web server, you might miss vulnerabilities because they might be in other binaries. And if you just look at all the binaries independently, you might actually get a lot of false positives because a lot of binaries will not even see user input at all. So you might say, well, this is vulnerable, but well, there's no way for anyone to exploit it because there's no way for anyone to in introduce any, any data. And, um, you know, in other cases, there might be constraints. The web server might already check or validate the input and then hands over only validated check input to the handler. So if you don't pass constraints from the web server's check to that handler binary, you will create a lot of false positives because it will look like, yeah, this is all unchecked input. The, the attacker can do whatever, but it's actually not true. So in order to really get uh, a solid grasp of these vulnerabilities, you have to essentially perform, you know, that whole system of multi-binary analysis where you understand how data flows through these binaries, these multiple components in the firmware, and what constraints are added as input is processed and potentially checked and where it ends up. And that's sort of what I said. Here you see now um, an example that we'll use for you know, the, the next few slides. Um, of course, this is uh, now written in C code. We don't have source code. Uh, we all do all our analysis on binary, but it's easier to explain. So what you see is a web server, right? And it, uh, you know, it has a serve request and then it parses the URI and then uh, it hands it over to this handler binary. And what happens is you, know, you, you first parse the URI, that's the request. Um, and you do some comparison, for example, we check if it starts with a particular network string here that, that indicates it's a SOAP request. And if so, you return it and otherwise you might actually do some length check and, and terminate it. And, and then what happens is, okay, so after you sort of processed or at least you know, did some maybe minimal checks on, on that, that request that you have received, you actually return that pointer and you put it into the environment. You basically set an environment variable query string where you put that data and then you exact that handler, right? You basically exact the handler that is associated with that request and at that point, the handler binary takes over on the right side. So you see the error switched over and it takes the uh, data out of that uh, environment um, associated with that query string key and uh, some other things from the environment that is not accessible by the attacker or you know that has no impact from, from actually information from the outside. And then it processes the request. And as you can see here, there is uh, some, some check, right? Is there some op? information and if not then you return but uh, uh, if there is 
you, you actually do two string copies. And in one case, you copy that queue, that, that, that query that you got into a local arg in a local um, array of size 128. And then you, you copy you know, the directory name of the log path into another array of equal size 128. And you know, in, that is called log deer here. And what you can see is that you know, the first is actually a bug, right? Uh, the attacker could send us a long string. It's not checked, um, especially if it has that SOAP add rule in it. It returns the pointer immediately. So that could be a very long string, puts it in the environment, the program reads it out, puts it in this arg um, buffer, and, and that there's a simple, very simple buffer overflow, right? Um, we noticed though that the second one would not be um, a buffer overflow or vulnerability that we care about because um, while it's simply, uh, it's also an unchecked write to a buffer, you actually have no, no chances the attacker, at least here, to influence um, the environment variable log path. And so when the directory name is extracted, presumably it fits the array. And so there's, there's no problem, right? And so you already see, you know, some of the things I've mentioned before, in order to find this vulnerability, you have to look at the handler binary. It's not enough to just look at the web server. And if you would just look at the handler binary itself, well, then you would see two string copies that are both essentially unchecked and you can't distinguish between them. So either you report both of them as vulnerable or not. And if you report both of them as vulnerable, you have now a false positive and you can say, who cares? I have one false positive for one real bug, that's fine. But unfortunately, if you do this in the real world and you look at the handler binary independently and you would do that uh, vulnerability analysis, you will get thousands, tens of thousands of alerts as I will show you um, in, the, in the evaluation. So it's really important to look at this in their entirety. And that's essentially what we do, right? So we call the first one a setter binary because it sets some values and the other one is like the consumer a getter. And so, as I said, to find bugs, we want to track how user data is introduced and propagated. And for that uh, purpose, um, you know, we've, we've built a system, we called it Caronta. It's also a, a paper that appeared, I think, uh, at uh, IEEE Security and Privacy in uh, 2019. So it's a static analysis tool that, you know, works on binaries and tracks data flows across multiple Linux binaries to find vulnerabilities in IoT devices. And um, it basically operates on three steps. First, it tries to discover the binaries out of many binaries that might be in a firmware image that actually introduce inputs into the system, right? That read user input. Then we basically have to track how data is shared with other binaries in the firmware. And once we have that, we can run our vulnerability analysis by starting at these border binaries and tracking the data flows within that binary, as well as across different edges uh, to other binaries where we then continue the analysis, right? So that's sort of the three simple steps uh, to, for happiness. And um, I'll um, dive a little bit into how we do this, right? So this is the overview of the system. Um, you know, you have to unpack the firmware, you do border binary discovery, you build this binary dependency graph, and then you can use a static taint tracking engine that we already had. Um, that is using symbolic execution to perform this multi-binary data flow analysis that you see on the right. And um, you know, then we wanna detect insecure interactions or cases where tainted data, user data flows into buffers in a way that you know, the constraints don't check the length and there could be an overflow. And we have a few other checks for uh, insecure interactions, but that's the you know, basic vulnerability analysis that we do here. And, and so to, to dive into how we do this in a little more detail. Um, first, we want to discover the border binaries, so those that, that might take user input. So we, we focused on those that receive data from the network. And our insight was, well, typically those, those what we call border binaries contain parsing code because they process these user requests, right? So we basically expect, hey, a border binary is one that contains a bunch of parsing code and reads data from the network. So um, we, we do this computation uh, in some, um, some heuristic way by computing parsing scores for binaries. Um, for, uh, in order to compute a parsing score for a binary, we compute a parsing score for each function in this binary. And uh, we use five features here, three of which have been taken from prior work, uh, where they looked at essentially the number of memory comparisons and branches and basic blocks for some kind of indication of complexity of, of, uh, of, a, of, a, of a function. And the assumption is if you parse, you do a lot of memory comparisons. And we sort of 
instantiated this into our problem where we also looked for specific network related keywords uh, that sort of um, a list of things that um, we observe that um, are frequently looked for um, as, as strings in, in you know, for example, SOAP protocols or other protocols that I, IoT devices frequently use that uh, you know, contributes to, to a, a feature called net. And then we, we look for data flows between receive a network operation and some memory comparison operations, right? Indicating that we want the data is, is read from the network. And uh, you know, then you get this, this fairly sort of simple weighted sum where you just you know, set some parameters, K here, uh, that are based on you know, some manual tuning on a small set of samples. And then you compute these, these scores and then you take the maximum of any function in your program and you assign that score to, to your program. And um, then you get a bunch of scores, well, one for, for each binary in, in, in your firmware. And, and then you would have to set the threshold, right? And you have to say, if that's above a threshold, um, then we assume it contains a parsing function and, and hence it's, it's a border binary that we want to consider. Um, we didn't like that threshold so much. Uh, so we, we basically um, found that, uh, you know, in some sense, those thresholds could vary between different devices. And it, it was hard to set one specific threshold that would work for all um, firmware images and all their binaries. Um, but we found uh, what, what we found um, worked well is that we could actually cluster those scores. And um, we, we found that in, within a particular firmware, Im uh, firmware image, um, the parsing functions of the border binaries would lead to fairly similar, I mean, not exactly identical, but fairly similar scores that were distinctively higher than the scores for pretty much all the other binaries, right? And so if we could cluster those binaries by their scores, and then you just take the, the big cluster with the, with the high score, then you know, it turned out that that actually worked really well to identify the border binaries in, in firmware images. So we didn't have a threshold and we could cluster around the scores and we basically just took that cluster with the, with the big scores. And that was the, the first step. And now we move to the second step, which is now, okay, let's build a binary dependency graph. Um, and here the, the question is, how do you do this? Like, uh, how, how, how do binaries communicate with each other, right? And clearly there's some inter-process communication. And again, here we could uh, leverage the fact that we knew stuff about Linux. So we could say, well, we understand Linux um, and you know, why don't we look at its IPC primitives, right? Uh, they're sort of a finite set. It can use the environment as we've seen before. It can use shared memory, it can use sockets, it can use files, uh, you know, but, but there's a limited set of them, right? And um, what is also interesting is that these IPC functions typically use some data keys to reference communication channels, like you know, a file name or the, the port of the socket or the name of a certain environmental variable. And the insight here is if two binaries wanna communicate with each other, they must know the name of this channel, right? They must bind to a socket and communicate to that socket or they need to know the name of the file. And uh, what we found is these, these are hard coded in binaries, right? They can either be hard coded in the binary itself, which actually happened frequently, um, could also be stored in some um, configuration files. But we, we found in many, many cases, these data keys are actually hard coded into the binaries themselves. And that gives us, gave us the chance to basically say, well, uh, why don't we just scan these binaries for IPC primitives and then do some, some analysis and try to find if we um, uh, or try to see if we can find the data keys, those those hard coded values um, that reference uh, those channels, right? So, for example, here in this binary, we would find, hey, it uses set env and the key, the data keys here, that string query string, and so we would find this would be a producer, a setter for an IPC primitive that uses the environment and uses that key, the data key query string, and so. In order to generate this, um, this dependency graph, we scan the binaries for IPC primitives. We determine, okay, is there an IPC primitive that gets or sets a value? And then we do static analysis to try to recover the data keys. And um, yeah, might not work always, but it works in many cases. And in this case, if we, we, if we are able to do it and we determine, hey, here's a binary that reads or that writes a particular um, IPC channel and we can recognize the shared data key, uh, then we, may, we create an edge, right? We say this binary seems to write, let's say query string, this other one reads it. So there's an edge, they could talk to each other using that, that string. So 
Uh, that's sort of the second step that we do, right? And so in this particular case, we would identify that the web server and the handler are actually linked because one sets, the other one gets uh, from the environment the value query string. So you, you, you create this, this edge, you create an edge between the set and the getter. And when we looked at the graph size, um, it's actually kind of interesting. So, you know, as you ima would imagine, there are some that are not connected, right? So there are border binaries that are not connected, so they're size one. But in many cases, there are actually, you know, more binaries involved, you know, five, six, seven, eight, up to 16 in one of these graphs. So you can see both that those graphs, I mean, they're not huge, huge, but they exist and they involve a number of binaries. Sometimes they can even include up to 16 binaries. And you can also see that the majority, so, you know, more than two thirds or about two thirds, three quarters of functionality in those firmware images is actually handled by multiple binaries. And we will see that also when we, when we look at the alerts that we found, uh, the vulnerabilities. Typically two thirds are multi-binary vulnerabilities. So it is an important problem to consider those. Then we perform multi-binary data flow analysis. I don't go too much into detail. We start from the identified border binaries. Uh, we start to introduce taint with um, variables you know, that are read from network and are compared against network related keywords. Oops, I'm sorry. Uh, we run a forward taint analysis, collect constraints, and uh, we use, a, we use a, a static analysis tool that we've used in prior work that does symbolic execution. And um, you know, the, the key idea is if you reach one of these setting points, we also continue the analysis at the getter points of those other binaries and basically treat that other binary as if it had read data directly from the user, right? So it's tainted. And um, we also pass on the constraints that we have observed or collected as we analyzed it in that first binary, right? So if there's a length check, that length check would propagate. If there's none, well, we know it's unconstrained data that goes into that second binary. And uh, you know, in, in this particular case, if you go back to that example, we would look at this here, right? So there's, uh, you know, you have a string compare of P with this SOAP add rule. Um, we know that this uh, data, you know, we know from more analysis that this comes from a, a network socket. So P is starting to get tainted now. And then we basically do forward uh, symbolic execution with the knowledge that this is tainted data. So we, we know this is actually passes the return value of parse URI, so it gets, here into the, the uh, variable data, it's set into the environment. And then we continue the analysis over there where it's, get old, where it's gotten out of the environment. Uh, so we know query is now untainted, uh, sorry, it's tainted, but unconstrained user input. And then we basically track it into the process request where we now see, hey, here's a problem. This is, this is a buffer overflow, a potential buffer overflow. And, and obviously there's no such edge for log path. So in this particular case, the second one would be considered not a problem, would be considered safe. Okay, so as I said, to, in order to detect bugs, we run the static data analysis, check whether the uh, tainted data is used at the sync in an unsafe, unconstrained way. And syncs are memory copy-like functions where stuff is moved and moved in a buffer. We also have dereferences of a tainted variable, a tainted pointer. Uh, we could create more syncs. So these are just the two syncs we started with. So you could look for other vulnerabilities um, as well. And then, um, you know, as I mentioned before, we do static taint analysis based on bootstomp uh, that uh, uses symbolic execution. See, the question is, is it necessary to use more complex string analysis? Um, not here. So in this particular case, um, you know, we, we basically, you know, it's bug finding. So, you know, there, there, there are definitely the chance for false positives where the uh, analysis might be too imprecise to determine, hey, there wouldn't be a problem. Uh, when in reality there is, or, or vice versa. Uh, we found that problem happens very rarely for this type of vulnerability that we look for, but there is nothing that you know, would prevent you to use our um, dependency graphs to run a more complex string analysis or different kind of static analysis that is not using symbolic execution on top of it. So um, definitely there are, there are different options. We just thought, hey, cool, we have already our analysis. We do a fairly simple taint analysis and it worked really well in practice. So, um, you know, that, that showed that the dependency graphs worked as intended, so to speak. And um, yeah, so in this particular case, we find this as a bug. Um, so let's talk a little bit about evaluation. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about fuzzing as well. So <laughs> let's talk about this evaluation. We started with a smaller set of uh, around 50 samples uh, from seven uh, IoT vendors that we scraped from their web pages. And then we also had a larger, almost 900 samples from some related work called Fermadyne. 
And we, we you know, we, we evaluated the initially the 53 samples you can see it here, right? And so there are thousands of binaries. So um, it's not like, you know, 53 samples means 100 binaries. There are thousands of these binaries. Um, and in the end, we created 87 alerts, right? So we analyzed those 50 samples. We analyzed all these thousands of binaries. We identified here 279 border binaries. Um, and we started to explore, um, explore things. And, um, and what we found then is if, when, we, when we checked these alerts in detail, uh, we found that actually 51 of those were bugs. So um, I think a very good true to false positive rate. And 34, so again, about two thirds were actually only recognizable by tracking the flow. So there were multi-binary vulnerabilities. And that sort of matches that size of the, the, that binary dependency graph that I told you before, right? It's about one third are um, single binaries, two thirds are not. And so that's also sort of how the bugs are distributed. And you know, we found a, a large number of previously unknown vulnerabilities. Uh, we rediscovered five known vulnerabilities that we had injected in the data set or that were present in the data set uh, to also check for false negatives. So said about two thirds are multi-binary vulnerabilities. And we always also did an analysis where we just ran our tool on all the binaries individually. And then you get 21,000 alerts, right? For those 50 binaries. So it is critical to do this multi-binary tracking. Otherwise you're just drowned in alerts. Uh, of course, you find also the 87 bugs, but you get uh, two orders of magnitude more, more bugs. And, and then we did the same on the large data set. And you know, the, the numbers are somewhat similar, right? We, we just you know, have everything scaled up by, by, by an order of magnitude, essentially. And uh, you, know, you get um, more alerts here. Um, and you know, we have you know, 900 samples multi-binaries, hundreds of thousands of binaries. And we basically took a hundred of those alerts that we inspected. So we, we actually produced more alerts than hundred, um, but hundred we inspected and um, we found 44 of them are true positive uh, where you know, user provided data actually reaches a sink and it's vulnerable. And again, you have uh, about two thirds of them multi-binary vulnerabilities showing it is important to do this type of analysis. So, you know, we're, we're happy with that. And we basically said, hey, you know, for, for Linux IoT devices, we could really do, uh, you know, better than just looking at individual binaries. All right, so that was sort of on the Linux side. Um, and um, now, you know, the question becomes, well, what about blobs, right? And I just wanna spend a little bit of time on this as well. What about blobs? Well, with the blobs, you have this big, large binary and you don't have the, the operating system abstraction anymore, right? So you have the device specific IoT code on those libraries, you know, hardware abstraction layers, libc stuff, it's all packed into one. And the only interaction that you really have is over, you know, the MMIO with your on-chip hardware peripherals, right? And so static analysis becomes very hard. Like where's the IPCs again, what's going on? I can't track this. Um, so, it becomes much harder and also static analysis, uh, you know, on large complex involved binaries gets much harder because, you know, you might not know exactly where to start. You have all these indirect memory references you can't resolve. It becomes very, very hard. And so what you want to do is, well, okay. So if static analysis is hard and, you know, this is binary blob, I have no abstractions. Can I just fuzz it? Can I just throw stuff at it and, um, you know, throw stuff at these programs with lots of inputs until something bad happens. And what you need is many copies of the code, right? Because you can run millions and tens of millions of these runs. And you know why this has this little bunny here, it's because that's an American fuzzy lop, which is uh, the sort of the name of a very well-known fuzzer, which is AFL, right? So this is basically a fuzzer that, you know, is a state of the art fuzzer that we would like to apply to our firmware blob to find bugs, right? Sounds, sounds easy enough. However, the problem is that you cannot just like run this. It's, it's on this device, right? It's embedded uh, in some hardware. Like how do you put inputs in there? How do you monitor that it has just crashed, right? So wouldn't it be awesome if you could just take this blob and put it in an environment that is much more under our control? Let's say an emulator, right? Why don't we just move it over to an emulator like QMU and then we can run it and we can just push all our data in and we can observe exactly what it's doing and we can stop at every instruction and uh, life will be good. The problem is 
you cannot just rehost things easily. You cannot just take this blob and put it in QMU and hope it works. Well, why not? So we still have these nasty MMO operations, right? Uh, that, that firmware wants to interact with its hardware peripherals. It, it's very closely tied. So it wants to read things from sensors. It wants to write things to something else. And you know, it, it, if it reads something, it expects certain data that is coming in a certain format. And so how do you handle those interactions with your hardware peripherals? And in general, they're sort of, you know, now there's been exploded uh, the work in this area of rehosting, but in general, there were sort of two areas. One is you could have a handwritten software plugin as part of the emulator of the QMO that basically emulates the hardware peripheral. So it does what the hardware is supposed to do, but in software. And that's excellent. Um, but as we will see, there are tens of thousands of hardware peripherals that are really hard to all write software plugins for by hand. There's another way. Uh, it's called the hardware in the loop analysis, where you basically hand over MMIO calls from the emulator to the actual device. So you run the firmware in the emulator, you take calls and you proxy, you forward them into the hardware peripherals. A uh, very well-known system that does that is Avatar. And that works great if you have to, well, it has problems, but it would still work okay if you have one firmware that you want to run. But we want to actually scale things up if you want to fuzz. You need to run hundreds, thousands of these firmware in parallel and you cannot just proxy all their calls to that hardware device. First, it will overload the hardware device. Second, it would confuse the hardware device uh, because there are all these calls coming in that, that are completely random and out of order. And third is like, if something goes wrong, you want to reset the binary and restart. And then you would have to reset the actual hardware with avatar, which takes, you know, sometimes a minute or so. So it, it does not scale up for fuzzing. So you need to do everything in software, but you, you, you know, Writing all these software plugins by hand is, 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 is crazy, right? Because the binary blob form is very, very complex. So you have you know, the CPU where your program runs and the memory bus to flash memory and RAM and then there are these on-chip peripherals, right? And then you have a lot of them. You have timers and you know, buses like serial buses or I2C bus or power configurations that go to the actual off-chip you know, cable to the device or cable to the light. And your MMIO interactions are actually between the CPU and this on chip part of the memory that maps all these different registers from these different devices into your memory, right? So you have, for example, even for a simple timer, you can have many, many registers, control registers, status registers, data registers. This is all very, very complicated, right? And if you would have to write by hand, um, models for that, you have to understand in detail what these, these registers do and how to handle them and what does a read to one of these registers mean and what does a write to that mean and then there is no data sheet, so how do you find out what's even going on? It's very, very complicated, right? And so, what we, you know, we just looked at this, right? I mean, it's even when you look at the data set of some Cortex-M, which is, you know, well-known ARM processor that is used uh, extensively in IoT devices, there are hundreds of chip models and you know 1,600 unique peripherals just in that, that little dump that we looked at. But in reality, there are tens of thousands, right? And as you see, mainline QMU um, you know, has support out of the box with these handwritten manual plugins for zero in that data set. Like, it just doesn't cover it. It's just so big and vast and diverse that you know trying to catch up with these handwritten peripheral um, implementations in software is just very hard. And so we, we, we tried a couple of things. And the first thing is that we tried is, okay, can we, can we learn those models automatically? Like if we observe, let's say in avatar, some, uh, some interaction between um, a device and a peripheral, uh, let's say we use avatar and sort of the hardware in the loop mechanism to observe what's going on. Can we automatically synthesize the actual model that we would need to basically simulate the peripheral device, right? And that might not be perfect, but maybe it's possible, right? That was our first attempt that led to a system called Pretender, right? So Pretender essentially has this, this emulated environment where you get an unmodified firmware and some MMIO mappings in. And initially you basically learn the interactions of this one firmware with the actual device using avatar and forwarding these interactions, proxying the calls. And later you, you try to learn from these interactions to basically 
build a model in software, these hardware models in software that you can then substitute for the real hardware. And then you can scale up and you can run many, many QMUs with many, many of these firmware samples and they all interact with your software models and you can you know, fuzz everything and scale everything up. So that was the plan. And the plan worked to some extent, but it was not super easy and it had some limitations. So one problem is, as I mentioned before, you know, you have the firmware, which is in gray here and it interacts with the internal peripheries over MMIO, but unfortunately that's all inside the CPU and we want to record the MMIO interactions, not the interactions over the bus between the internal and the external peripherals, right? And so for that, we had to use avatar, right? So we're basically using avatar to proxy the MMIO calls that avatar intercepts through QMRIO and then hands over to the internal peripherals on the actual device. So we re could record it, and then, you know, we had a problem with interrupts and I'm sparing you the details, but interrupts are very complicated in embedded devices and um, they happen all the time and you need to sort of understand them and, you know, they, they interfere with avatar. And if you have too many of them, you know, everything breaks. So it's somewhat complicated, but, you know, we, we, have, we found a way to deal, deal with interrupts. So we handled them. And then we, we built modeling, right? And modeling basically is, first we have to find out you have, you know, some memory location where MMIO calls, reads and writes happen. Like the firmware reads and writes from a piece of memory that is memory mapped that basically says, hey, all my peripheral devices are mapped into regions of that MMIO um, part. And we have to even figure out which group of memory locations belong to which peripheral. Then we have to handle the interrupts that I sort of mentioned, I don't go into details. And then we have to assign or build these models for each of these locations within a particular peripheral. And um, um, yeah, so I just want to sort of show you uh, how this works. I got the, you know, a quick question on the difference between internal and external peripherals. Well, sort of the, the internal peripherals is, um, are, are sort of chips that are on the board, right? So if you get an, an IoT device and you have now an embedded board and you have the CPU, which is the processor, but then you have, um, let's say, some controller that is the I2C or the UART controller. And those are essentially on board uh, or on chip peripherals because um, you know those are controllers that maybe share the memory bus with the real CPU. And so if you have writes of the CPU that go directly into those sort of registers of these uh, peripheral chips, uh, that would be an on-chip peripheral. And then, you know, to that controller, you might have a cable that connects to an LED or, you know, to some, some other de device that like is a button or something like that. No. Um, and we, of course, want to understand, you know, the conversation between the device and that, that controller, the I2C controller or the timer, stuff like that, right? Okay, and so um, you have these reads and writes, right? They're really just reads and writes um, that, that happen and, you know, they go to different addresses and they, you know, they are different values. And, you know, we basically see, okay, how does this work? You know, we know where the MMIO region is. We don't know which parts of these regions are mapped to which peripheral, but what we basically observe is, Typically, those different subregions uh, of that uh, MMIO space, you have sort of dense areas where reads and writes happen, and that's typically a cluster for a particular peripheral, and then you have some space between other peripherals. And so uh, a very simple clustering algorithm, again, to the rescue, we can sort of cluster read and write accesses, and we can say, you know, every cluster is very likely the read and write accesses that belong to one particular on-chip peripheral. And you know, that worked well. It finds dense related areas with gaps in between. And so then we started to model MMIO, right? And um, here's where it's getting a little bit sketchy uh, because uh, you know, the interactions can be very, very hard, very complicated and um, you know, arbitrary really, right? Those, those uh, on-chip peripherals can hold state, there's state in the real world. Um, and we just see, you know, a tiny number of interactions between the firmware and that, that on-chip peripheral, right? But what we observed is that certain interactions are actually recurring all the time and they fall into certain patterns. For example, if you have this, right? So someone reads a value, you get one, you write 42, you read the same register and you get 42, then you write a number and then you get that same number back on the next read, right? That looks like some storage model, right? So you write a value, and if you read something, you basically get the most recently written value, okay? In other cases, you might have a bunch of writes, 
then you do some, maybe it's a write only model. We never read from there. So we don't have to care about it because there's no input for my um, firmware. What if you have this where you have read one, two, four, and then one, two, four. So this looks like some pattern, some simple repeating pattern that happens all the time. Um, what about this where you have 12, 48, 96, 123, 144, seems to be increasing values, right? So that could be a timer or some kind of counter. So you learn that as an increasing model and you learn how much it increases, right? So many, many of these interactions you can sort of map into one of these well-known interaction buckets, right? And that helps, helps quite a bit. And then there is the, the very complicated one where you, you can't do much, uh, where, you know, maybe it's some kind of data, right? So here you have uh, a temperature and humidity sensor and you write T that says, give me the temperature. And then you see, you can read here 72 Fahrenheit, character by character. And then you write and say, give me the humidity and it's a 67%. You say, give me the temperature again, 74 Fahrenheit, right? So that would be some simple interaction over a bus, a data bus. And how do we model this? Well, that is something where we, we have something simple that is called a state approximation. And with that state approximation, we basically say, well, can we recover the entire state machine? Probably not, especially if it's a complicated one. But can we just guess and return random values to the program? No either, because for example, that temperature sensor was really expecting the F for Fahrenheit and the percent for humidity at the end of something that it reads. Otherwise it would just fail, right? Because you know they expect that data to come. And this is where that state approximation comes in. And what would we leverage here is that if you trace with all the read and write accesses, right? To every register. And in principle, we could just replay that trace, right? So whatever we have recorded, we just replay. But that has some problems because it's not very flexible. And also if you sort of fall off the trace, then you have nothing to replay anymore. So what do you do? So what we basically do is, is we say, we, we, we try to be a bit smarter where we say, well, let's consider a write to a peripheral to change its state. And reads that happen in between writes, we're sort of considering as reads that deliver data for that particular state. And then we introduce what we call a state pointer for each register R that is initially initialized to the start of the trace. And so then we basically say, when the firmware just reads R, we try to just advance our state pointer and the trace to the next read access and return that value, right? And then move the state pointer forward. And if there's no additional read operation present in that current state, we're sort of always returning the most recently read value. We sort of return the last read value. But what is interesting is when the firmware writes to R, we actually don't just move it to the next write. We move it to the next location in the trace that was writing that specific value to R, hoping that this is essentially changing the state to the same state that we've seen before. And if we don't find anything, any write going forward, we would actually search backwards for a write of that value. So we can actually now jump around in the trace. And whenever the, the firmware writes, we're trying to find a, a spot in that trace that is hopefully matching the intention of that write and puts us in that state. So if we revisit that state approximation here again, right? Um, so whenever the firmware writes a T, we're in state here at the beginning. And you know, if it reads, we give seven, two, F. If it reads more, we give F, 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 F. If it writes another T, we jump here and then we'll give seven, four, F. If it writes an H, we jump back here and then would we'll return six, seven percent, right? And so we could sort of replay simple state machines in this particular way. Will it work always? Absolutely not, but it's better than just replaying a trace and not, not and failing when the trace ends or when you get desynchronized. And um, I know I'm sort of running a little low on time. I'll just want to tell you a little bit about how the results here. So this hey, Chris, because yep. we're low, running low on time, I just wanted to let you know there are a couple of questions in the chat. Um, the, the three that were in the chat, I think I answered. I tried to answer those while I was going. Okay. Um, the, the last one, do you feel you guys got to that? Um, the one with the difference between internal and external? Yeah, I answered that. Okay, and, uh, wonderful. Yeah. But those three I answered, hopefully. Perfect. Okay, so cool. So we basically on that evaluation, very simple. We, we used an MBAT framework with six samples. That's an ARM-based um, framework. We had three different boards, uh, two from ST, one from Max. Um, fairly simple, but stateful uh, peripherals. 
Uh, three of them were fully interactive and we actually injected synthetic vulnerabilities. And, uh, you know, here, here they are. Um, very simple things, right? Like a blinking light, uh, a, a terminal where you, where you uh, interacted over UART, a button that did something, the thermostat, a, a simple lock, right? But there were a bunch of peripherals, you know, timer, general purpose IO, GPIO, UART, AM2315, a button, a radio interface, so a bunch of interfaces. And um, we basically extracted models. And, and what we see here is like REC is, is is the number of basic blocks uh, that were touched while we recorded the trace. And here you see, when we create models automatically and in software, they actually allow us to perform what we call survival execution. That means we can run the firmware now and SH those stands for state approximation. It means we were able to essentially with the SA model get the same blocks as we got during recording. So we could basically run this, the sample like in avatar, like doing recording. And if you have a null model where you just give back null on every read, you can see it fails very, very quickly, right? So those models work and they actually allow us at least to do the same thing as we got while we recorded, right? But even more interesting, we could actually, and you know, those three samples that took interactive data where we could feed no data in, we could actually fuzz now. And when we fuzzed, we were able to exercise more basic blocks than we touched during recording. So the fuzzing actually worked and with our synthesized models, we were able to touch more of the firmware than we were touching when we recorded. So that was great. And we also found three bugs that we injected. So it was not very surprising, but, but at least it shows that those models actually worked, right? And so that was great. But we had a number of, of issues here, right? So first we, we found re recording is tricky, especially with frequent interrupts. The state approximation model is really very, very approximate, right? It, it can't capture uh, a lot of more complex interactions and we can't record what we cannot observe. So that was sort of the um, problem with DMA that has been actually addressed by another group in a recent Oakland paper just now. So DMA was always a problem. And um, I know I've just probably had like, three to five minutes left. So I just give you a taste of the other one uh, where we basically said, can we use a different abstraction layer as the basis of rehosting, right? And the, the key idea really is in the modern firmware stack, right? If you look at this firmware, the gray part and the hardware peripherals, we've basically chosen an interface between the gray and the green that is particularly hard to emulate because of that huge variety of hardware peripherals, right? They are thousands, tens, thousands of them. It's, it's very, very hard. So is that the right level of abstraction? Should we really basically emulate the hardware peripherals to the firmware or can we do a little bit better? And the idea is if you drill into that gray, that firmware, you actually see, hey, it's not just a device specific, the application code. There are all these libraries and protocol stacks and hardware vendor, hardware abstraction layers, right? And those, are very, very popular, are becoming very, very popular. And those are basically libraries that board or IoT device manufacturer give to developers to entice them to build on their devices, right? So they are sort of simple, simplified libraries so that people don't have to deal with the intricacies of that lower level um, code. And so why not do higher level emulation where basically instead of emulating the hardware peripherals, we're, we're putting replacement models at the level of the vendor hall, right? Or maybe even at the level of the protocol stacks and peripheral libraries themselves, right? Because those is almost like operating system calls. There are many, many more of them, but they have a, you know, a much clean abstraction and much less complicated. And that's what we did with a system called Hallucinator. We basically, uh, replace these halls and other libraries with simple Python-based implementations. And we transformed the rehosting scaling problem from supporting these tens of thousands of devices to a small number of halls, maybe 10 or eight or six. And that actually worked really well. Um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm showing you just the results here, but it allowed us to basically fuzz, you know, real world devices that are complicated, right? So these were, IP stacks, web servers. Uh, we could interact with our devices that are virtualized. We had hundreds of millions of fuzzing runs. 
you know, we rediscovered bugs, we found new bugs, um, we got CVEs, um, new buffer overflows, right? That approach, you know, was, was basically working on a much more well-defined interface. And um, that allowed us to build simple Python-based models that really allowed us to run these applications in a very flexible fashion. So unfortunately, I couldn't tell you exactly how we did it. The paper is called Hallucinator. Um, it was in last year's Usenix Security, but it really showed you that picking the right level of abstraction makes a big difference. And as a question, are there formal specs? No, it's basically uh, no formal specifications. Um, you know, you, you, you basically read the documentation uh, that those either HAL manufacturers or that the library creators give to you, and then you can read the source code. Um, yeah, formal specs would be great, but basically we had to look at the code um, or the name of the function and then write simple implementations. Um, okay, and so what, what I'm particularly proud of, it actually allowed us uh, to reuse that system in a real CTF competition in that seesaw competition that used that competition board that you see here. And we could rehost 18 of 19 challenges and looked at them, right? Um, by hand and, and three challenges were automatically solved using fuzzing, right? And this was basically given to people with the ex expectation that they manually reverse engineer all of this, right? So this was hard real world examples in a CTF competition and the tool just rehosted almost all of it automatically. And that of course gave us a, a huge leg up in analyzing, analyzing that firmware in the emulator. So that, that worked really well. And um, yeah, I think uh, you know that's that's what I wanted to share. I'll just give you one more slide. Sorry, it's like the build the the Steve Jobs. There's one more thing. I I would be remiss to not mention Anger. Um, it's a system that you know that has a lot of built-in analysis techniques, both static and dynamic and symbolic execution engine um, for binaries and for firmware analysis. So if you're interested, check it out. It's on Anger.io. Uh, you know. 5,000 stars on GitHub, huge software project, many, many people involved. It's used by academic projects, industry, government. So if you have anything to do with binary analysis and you want to find vulnerabilities, there are a bunch of tools, but um, we found Anger to be um, limiting in some sense the barrier to enter. So um, hopefully, you know, you, you find it useful. All right, with that, um, I think I'm, I'm ending. Um, you know, we have one minute left. Um, Thanks a lot for um, attending. I saw a few questions in the chat. If there are any other questions, i um, happy to answer them. Please let me know. And um, if not, I think I have a number of one-on-ones uh, throughout the rest of the day. So happy to discuss also on one-on-one. On -on -one. Thank you very much. Awesome. Yes, thank thank you. Thanks so much. So I think we still can take a couple of questions. Um, there's one. Um, came from a dynamic analysis for multi-binary vulnerability firmware. Um, yes, in some sense, if you if you do dynamic analysis, I mean, if you actually run the programs, then um, that would be okay, and you would automatically do multi-binary analysis because that first binary typically launches that second binary. So if you perform dynamic analysis of the first, you would sort of launch implicitly the the next one as well. Um, so yeah, I. I I see uh, no reason why why you couldn't. And um, I think if you choose dynamic analysis, you would also want to consider multiple binaries and not limit yourself to one because of just the nature of how those bugs, um, those bugs are truly uh, split over multiple, multiple binaries. Any other question from audience? Um, maybe let me also, also, also ask you one more question. Um, in the firmware you analyzed, did you observe any uh, like this uh, MMIO, any similarities across the firmware? All, this, all the firmware actually, different firmware has different like, MMIO mapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, I think the, the only similarities were that we observed was really, okay, you know, you see certain types of, uh, of interactions, right? I mean, you know, those, those sort of counters or patterns uh, that, that we saw and, you know, other papers in, in the meantime, I've, I've picked up on this as well. I think there's uh, one from Northeast and from Long Lou, it's called P2IM that, that sort of had a similar, similar observation, right? There are sort of types of, of interactions. I think 
if you look at the peripherals and the boards, it's, it's really crazy because even if you have the same firmware and the, you know, the same board manufacturer, if they have slightly different configurations, the whole MMIO mapping changes completely. Uh, and, and even the, the library code that interacts with that is completely different, right? It is as if it's two different things, although it's, hey, almost identical, it should be identical, it's the same hardware vendor, but it, it changes very, very rapidly. So that, that was a huge problem. And, um, and that's why we sort of set, found that the higher level, like the libraries and the HAL are actually much more stable because here you get one hardware abstraction layer. And in some sense, all the complexity and mapping is hidden in their own libraries. So if you intercept it on top, then you don't have to deal with it if you want to do that sort of replacement. What happens if you cannot find that uh, API and library abstraction? If, what happens if the, if the code is directly interact with this port, with this peripheral register? Yeah, yeah. Then you have to do, do basically move to to the, the MMIO based um, based uh, interface, right? But in some sense, it reminds me of um, of, of the way the, the Windows kernel is op is operating, right? Because it also has the Windows API, which essentially is a, a very large set of libraries that are stable, and then they have the actual system call interface, which is something they change frequently and is interacting with their micro kernel, right? And so in some sense, that guarantees. Our Windows API is stable, and what we do below, even in user mode, is, is up to us essentially, right? And I think most legitimate programmers would go against this library, right? Once you start to talk about malware, of course, they will bypass the HAL, they can do whatever they want. But if you're assuming, you know, benign, buggy programs, then you know you typically don't have to deal with you know attempts to bypass bypass that layer and for developers there's very little reason to actually want to bypass that right because then you have to deal with all that complexity i'm not saying it cannot happen but but we are really seeing a strong trend towards these halls and they almost serve like a windows api layer now mm -hmm. all right so um if no more question i think that concludes today's uh distinguished lecture Thank you, Chris, again. Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the invitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, sad that I can't be there with you in person. Maybe at one point we can, we can do an actual on-site visit. Yes, yes, absolutely, yeah. All right, excellent, All right. thank you. Thank you. Bye.